All right. Um, hello, everyone. So, Recording in progress. Said, I'm a year four student, graduating soon. And today I'll be talking about creating prototypes that prove a point. So can I just have like a raise of hands? How many of you all actually have created prototypes before or like, you know, created solutions that kind of um, for like entrepreneurship or like hackathons or something? Your hands? One, two, three. Okay. Quite a bit, right? So um, actually in today's talk, I was just talking um, with the organizing team, right? I hope that we have more participation, right? It never happens. All of our professors have failed to get any sort of participation from us, but I hope that we have more participation. So uh, my slides are usually like this. I have a lot of memes and um, very bad design, okay? <laughs> so, all right. So a brief information, a uh, brief like, um, things that I've done before. So I started in year one, I was very much interested in entrepreneurship and I went on to start various projects and here are all the logos that I've created over the three years. Uh, unfortunately, none of them became successful, otherwise you would see me here speaking in a different capacity. But as they say, right, those who cannot do teach. So um, I've created a lot, a lot of prototypes before and um, I kind of want to share with you my experience so in today's session, we will do something like this. I'll pose some questions, and all you have to do is raise your hand if you agree with it. Um, and I promise I won't call you out, I won't ask you the reasons behind your answer. You can just raise your hands freely. And there are no wrong answers. So today's session is actually my own reflection. So I'm not taking any other concept from out there and presenting it to you, but it's my own reflection. I would appreciate your feedback, and let's have a, let's have a discussion. So all right, let's have a show of hands. How many of us think that a prototype is a proof of concept? All right, all right, quite a bit. Uh, how many of us think that a prototype is a minimal viable product? All right, so this is a problem that I had when I initially started thinking about this topic. And when I went onto the internet, I tried to find the difference between these terms and everyone defines it differently. So what I did is that I kind of came up with my own set of definitions, which is here, all right? So what I say is that a proof of concept is trying to do something in a very small scale, right? You don't need to worry about anything. It's just that you need to prove that if you have a solution, if you say that it can help the entire world, can you help 10 people? Doesn't matter how you do it. Doesn't matter if you write, even if you don't even write a single line of code. Prototype, is actually kind of preparing for a launch. Now, what do I mean by launch? By launch, I mean that you release your product and now you're not sitting in front of the person who's using it. You see, the dynamics are completely different. When I give my solution to you and you're sitting in front of me, I'm like, hey, press this, press that, press that. But when you find a solution out of the internet, I'm not there to say anything, right? And then the last one, an MVP, is the final prototype version or the product that you launch, okay? So these are our definitions. And if some of you might have heard about Lean Startup Strategy, uh, from there, I, I kind of put this into my definition like this, that when you launch your solution, that's when you start the build, measure, learn, do, all right? So when you're creating your prototype, I'm not saying that you're building to measure or whatever, I'm saying when you launch your product, that's when you start the build, measure, learn, do, okay? So the first question, right? So this is a problem I face. Um, I was working on a solution that claimed that is a um, generative AI chatbot, and I said that our solution, to, using our solution, you can create like a chatbot for your customer service that does not hallucinate, right? So the problem is that ChatGPT, any question you ask it, it comes up with some made-up answer. If you use it for customer service, someone comes to your website and says, uh, do you have a discount? Usually ChatGPT will say yes, and then, it's a whole set of problems. So this is the setup I was working on. Let's think about the prototype. What do you think is the most important feature of this prototype, all right? So how many of you all think that the core feature, that is no hallucination, must be in the prototype? Okay, yeah, I mean reducing it, in a sense that you try to reduce it for a specific use case. I'll share more on how it works on the technical side. Yeah. Is yeah, it's very hard, right? Yeah, correct. 
Uh, but there are some methods you can use. Um, what you can do is that every time, let's say that you have a call to the AI agent, right? You set up certain parameters and you retrieve the information. And if you do not retrieve any information, you can block it right away over there. So you don't do the inferencing unless you have certain things or keywords in the query, basically. Yeah, correct, heavily minimize it. So, uh, but then again, you can always hallucinate, right? But it, let's assume that in this hypothetical scenario that, it, that there's a way to create it in a way that it does not hallucinate, right? So the question here is that when you're creating your prototype, you have very limited resources, right? So where do you dedicate most of your time, right? So how many of y'all think that the core feature must be in the prototype? Raise your hands. All right. Yeah. <laughs> then how many of y'all think that there should be fancy features in the prototype? Like for example, you put in your website URL and it creates like a chatbot for you. Okay. Okay. And how many of y'all think that the most time should be put into like a sleek UI and a good landing page? No one. <laughs> okay. Well, the answer is it depends. Right, but just like any other professor, I'm not just going to tell you that it depends. I'm going to tell you what it depends on, and this is something that I learned um, after doing a lot of mistakes. It depends on the launch strategy. When you think of a solution, you come up and you think of what features I can build, how I, how I can make this in the fastest way possible. Maybe you think that I want to make a minimal viable product that just has the core features, right? But what happens in most cases, you create a minimal viable product, you launch it, and no one clicks on it, right? So you first need to identify what is your launch strategy, and that will determine what should go into your prototype. Is the other way around. In this case, for example, our launch strategy was to send companies a chatbot for their company in a LinkedIn message. We sent them a message, message, we said, hi, we created a chatbot for you, check it out. Doesn't have to be hallucination proof, like they, they're not gonna spend so much time on it, but it does need to have a very fancy feature that allows me to create the chatbot by just using the URL. And this is where we spend most of our time and we reach out to people, we got a few customers, and after talking to them is when we started working towards the no hallucination part. All right, so the first takeaway from today's talk is that prototype features depend on the launch strategy, all right? Second, so this is another project I was working on. It was also an MRKL agent, all right? So it's a shopping assistant. You ask it, uh, oh, hi, I'm looking to buy this. It gives you all the specs or whatever. It goes on to Google search API. It fetches the product information and shows you in a chatbot setting, right? Let's say that I create this chatbot and I bring together a few of my friends to test it. What should I be testing for? UI UX? Okay, okay. Problem validation. Okay. Solution validation. Okay. All right. Take away two. Basically, what happened, let me tell you this, right? I created a chatbot, and this is after ChatGPT came out, okay? okay. I, I put, put it in, in front, front of users, user. and then they look at my face, and then they ask me, oh, so what should I do? It looked exactly like ChatGPT, but because they have never used it for shopping before, they didn't even bother to go over there, put in information, and start chatting with a chatbot. They just look at you, and then they ask you, oh, so what should I do next? Should I click this button, should I click that? And trust, these are like, my friends and random people I find on the street, right? I go there, I just stop them and I ask them, oh, uh, by the way, do you want to test it out? They look at me, oh, what is this about? So confused, I don't know what's going on, right? Um, okay, let's say I get a group of people, I sit them down together. Do you think my friends would tell me there's a bad solution? Do you think that if I find a random person on the street and I show this solution, and I'm very passionate about it, I'm pitching it, because that's important. Would you have the guts to come and tell me that, ah, no, 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 like, this is useless, don't waste your time. It's very hard. In a setting where you are face to face with me and I'm talking to you, it's hard for you to give me honest feedback. So it's very hard to validate a problem and a solution because every idea I come up with and every prototype I come up with and everyone I show to first face to face, they think it's a good idea. 
None of them work. You should only start testing your problem validation and solution validation when you launch it, when you're not in front of them. Because them using it is the best measure that your solution is useful, not them giving you feedback about it. So when you create prototypes, what you want to ensure that when I'm not in front of the user, are they able to use it? Right? This is very counterintuitive because whenever we think about tech development, we think that, all right, um, like, like uh, UI doesn't, doesn't matter, matter as, long as long as the, the core, core functionality is there and blah, 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 right? You release it, you're not in front of the user, they have no idea how to use it. And there's a big problem because when I release it onto Reddit or somewhere else and people open the chat board and they don't know they're supposed to chat, they're supposed to chat with it, right? What's the point of the prototype in the first place then? Right. right. So the okay. best thing you can test in focus group is UI UX. Now then I have an interesting question and I'm not too sure like what's the answer to this, right? Imagine you're making a B2B solution that also has a chatbot. Okay. Now if you go to any founder, you say like, oh, how are you conducting your testing? They're saying, oh, it's a B2B startup. I'm waiting for someone from the industry to come and give me feedback. And now that takes very long, let me tell you. For you to start with nothing, to message someone, to get them on the table, and to get the feedback, that takes very long. But small things like UI UX is usually more generalizable. If I show it to a person who is not even my target customer, but they can interact with the platform, they can click on buttons, and the user behavior is as I intended, that is already a huge step forward when it comes to prototyping. And this can actually save you a lot of time, if you think about this. Next time when you have a prototype, think that, do I really need my target user to test every small thing down to the detail? Or if anyone I show it to and they're able to, you know, like an orange color or blue color, that can give me a lot of information. And this is what I've been thinking about, right? And my, my conclusion is that prototypes not always need to be tested with the target user. There are a lot of things you can test without going to the target user. And I'm not talking about the build, measure, learn, by the way. Right? I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about before you launch it. All right, so case three. Um, I worked on an open source project in which I created directed AI agents. All right? So you know, like AutoGPT, you put in your information, you put in the task there, the agent things, whatever it does, uh, and it solves the problem. Do you think before releasing this open source project, I should I ensure that 80 to 100% of the task the agent is able to finish. How many of you think yes? Yes? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good point, which is a takeaway. <laughs> yeah, but in a sense that, okay, so how many of y'all think no? Right. And how many, how many of y'all think it depends? All right, great. <laughs> the best answer, right? <laughs> Okay, you see, in this case, it really, really depends. I'm not too sure how many of y'all have used AutoGPT before, right? Um, I've used it, it does not work, right? Try to give it a task when it gets a bit more complicated, it does not work. But if you are just talking, talking from an adoption point of view, you go on to their GitHub repository, you see how many stars they have. More than a thousand last I checked, and that was very long ago. So a project, that, that does, does not work, work and, and does, does not claim to do what it does, had so many stars, why? And the answer to that is, in the real world, when you go out and you're looking to create a company, there's always something called market trends, right? Now, if you sit down at the back and you're like, my prototype should work, should work, should work, and you miss the big market trend, if you release your agent with 80% of the task two years from now, you're not gonna get anything. You're not gonna get any clicks, right? Because every website claims, even all the GPT claims to a certain extent, that our agent is good. All you can say is like, you will go onto your web page or wherever you're gonna write, completes 100% of the task. Do you really think that that will get people to click on it? Not really. So the third takeaway is that don't spend so much time on your prototype till you miss the market trend. Because even if you release a shitty product when the market is trending, you'll get more eyes on it as opposed to releasing a good product when no one cares about it. 
And when you have more eyes on it, from there you can start again, the build measure loop, right? Make it better from there, right? But release it after two years, no one clicks on it, you're never gonna go to the phase from prototyping to your MVP and to build measure learn. All right, so this is like putting it all together, right? And the, the, the biggest mistakes I did uh, while creating all these prototypes and testing different stuff is that I'll think about the problem, I'll think about the solution, I'll come up with an MVP that's very basic, I also develop in a week. I'm not saying that I make it very perfect or whatever, but it still doesn't work. Because basically, like a YouTuber cannot measure the quality of their videos or whether their content is engaging or useful if no one clicks on it on the first place. So why bother, right? The first thing you should come up with, how can I show this to the world? How can I get the clicks? Is it on Telegram? Then your prototype should be a Telegram bot, perhaps. Is it on Reddit? Maybe your solution should be an open source project, right? Is it through Google Ads? Then maybe you need a good website, right? Is it through LinkedIn ads? Maybe you need to come up with a way to be more credible. Think of the launch strategy and then think which prototype features you should have. Second, prototype feature, prototype doesn't have to all come together. If you just want to see whether people click on this button or not, you can just code that part. You don't need to create the full solution. A prototype, during your prototyping phase, you can have small solutions because you're in front of the user, right? Just ask them, see how they behave. But when you're doing your MVP, put all those, piece, all those pieces together. Because now you're sure that if your product requires the user to click on the red button to work, you're sure that in your focus group testing, at least you know that people will click on the red button. Now when you're not in front of them, you can assume with a decent probability that they'll click on it. The third one is that prototype, again, yeah, the prototype is for user testing and MVP is to validate your problem and your solution, right? If you release it out in the open, people click on it, people use it. If it's a big enough problem, they even use your shitty MVP. That, that's how you know that it's a big enough problem because when I have a problem and even if I don't have the best solution, I still try to use whatever I have. And then the last one is that a prototype launch should be a good balance between how long is this thing trending and how long it takes me to complete it. Yep, yep. that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, any questions? Can you, can you share with us about the, uh, what do you say, the, the, the build, you know, the, the one at the beginning, the build test launch, or something uh, else, do you say? Uh, this one? Yeah, yeah how can you share with us a little bit more about build measure learn? Okay, so, <coughs> uh, under Lean Startup Strategy, you have this um, idea that you build something, and then you release it, and then you see how people are interacting with your piece of software. And if you just bring it down to like the software use case, you then think, uh, you then put in measures within your software to measure the user interaction. And then you measure those key metrics, and then based on those key metrics, you then uh, basically learn whether your initial hypothesis that people would like it, for example, or something else is true. And if it is true, and you learn that, then you know that you continue doing that. But that's not always the case, right? So if usually the measurements are not up, up to the standard, and you learn something, you come up with another hypothesis of why is that happening, and then you build it again. And then you launch it again. And you keep on doing this until you see more and more people adopt your solution, right? And when they adopt it, it's very obvious because usually adoption, no matter what stage, follows an exponential curve. So that means that you will suddenly see people using your product and sending you like customer inquiries, which you did not expect. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? How many prototypes have done so far? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think around 15 so far. 
in the past three years. Yeah. Is it mainly software or software? No, mainly software. Yeah. Okay. So I make a prototype, then I go out, I test with people, I try to get some insights from there. Um, yeah. So completing the entire process like around 15 now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One five. Yeah. Then how about the funding? Are you self funding or you get funding from government or? Uh, okay, so funding depends on the project. So in some cases, I got funding from universities. In some cases, I also got funding from uh, private entities in the form of grants, if it's useful for them. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then some projects were not so resource heavy. So we did not really require a lot of funding for that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, um, mostly AI. So other than generative AI, I also did computer vision. So I did like animal nose print recognition. So I'm not too sure if you all know, uh, humans have a unique fingerprint, right? Yeah. Certain animals have a unique nose print. Uh, and then it becomes very useful in case of insurance. Like you want to insure your dog, how would the insurance company know that you know, you're claiming for the same dog? Right? <laughs> At the end of the day, or the same for like farming and uh, livestock. Other than that, uh, not really, mainly AI, yeah. yeah. I thought you had an open source project. Yeah. Um, could you share us more about like, um, how is it um, different from agent GPT and other details? Mm. So uh, that's an example of the hype trend. So <laughs> if you ask me what's very different, the answer is not much. But I always try to add a bit on to what's already out there. So when I released it, um, initially I released it with GPT, but then I changed it to an open source model. Um, the performance was not as good, but then again, the hype cycle took it from, initially when I released like the GPT version on Reddit, I got like 60 stars. Uh, when I changed it to open source, uh, even though the performance went down, uh, the adoption increased because of the hype cycle and it went on to 300 stars. Um, what's different is that usually if you, if you see like, um, AI agents, they trip when they need to, when they need to plan. Because it's a very well-known, um, how to say, it's a very well-known limitation. So what you do is that you prompt it in a way where uh, you kind of tell it which tool to use for which task. So you reduce the planning job over there, which increases the accuracy. Um, I mean, just a follow-up question. <coughs> when you started the open source project, what, what's your sort of like, timeline? Like you, you advertise on Reddit first. Or how do you get the initial like, 60 stars to 100 stars? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a very good question, question right? Um, the way, way I started, started this project is very different from the rest, and that's why you see more adoption. Because I went on to Reddit first, and I saw that a lot of people were talking about agents. And I was like, all right, maybe at the start, I'll just try to uh, replicate what's out there, right? With maybe adding a bit more of accuracy, which is what I did. So the same forums in which they were talking about agents is the same forum I released it. And, and suddenly, suddenly my, my post got like 100 uploads uh, because they were already talking, talking about it. And, and then, then I saw on other Reddit forums as well as mine that people are talking, hey, if there's an open source version, it would be great. And I was like, all right, it's, it's the hype cycle, cycle, right? I make it open source, I release in the same subreddit, there are about 200 like, uh, uploads, and then it just went on from there. Yeah. yeah. How do you identify problems worth solving? Um, okay, so that's a. That's a <laughs> Very good, good question. question right? I am not, not the best person, person to answer because I don't have a successful company. company but um, the way to do it is usually, like, if I think about it, there are mainly three ways, right? One is uh, you, you see it online, like you see it in the market, right? People are talking about it. Oh, if it was like this, it would be better, right? A lot of forums talk about a lot of things. For example, if you want to start a company for, let's say, a uh, solution for moms, right? You go to like a forum where a lot of mothers are talking about the problems they face. And then you see what's repeating over there, right? And you come up with a solution and then you launch it in the same forum. So that's the initial prompt for you. But then you need to keep on seeing how they interact with it to then validate whether the problem is worth doing or not. Um, another way to do it is that you experienced it yourself. So well, then in that case, you can hope that, that all right, I, I really, really don't, don't like this. this. But I came up with a solution for me. Now I just need to find other people like me who might have this problem. And then you release it there. And then you hope that your problem is more generalizable to the rest. Yeah. But don't do something that you do not face yourself. Like if you do not face a problem yourself, 
it's very hard for you to understand what the person who faces the problem goes through. And that has a lot of like problems for you to create any solution even near to something that can solve that problem. Yeah. But how do you generalize this to like, you know, like a B2B uh, sort of context? Okay, so for B2B, for example, um, okay, so let's say that you talk about customer service chatbots, right? You know that every company wants a good customer service chatbot, right? Uh, if you don't know about it, you can at least just talk to a few people who are trying to implement it by sending emails. And if you are from tech, you know that hallucination is a big problem, right? So, and you know that they know it. Right? All this is because you have been observing the market. Right? You, you constantly see, see what people are talking about. You need to be in that space. So you, know, you have this insight. And then now you have the keywords that, okay, a customer service chatbot that does not hallucinate will have some interest. Right? And then you make up something, right? something presentable in a sense. And you reach out to those people. So that's how you do B2B. But if you come and tell me that I want to do a B2B solution, uh, for a particular industry and I have never worked in that industry before, I'm not from that industry, um, becomes very hard. Like I give you an example, like a friend of mine was doing uh, a B2B solution to take notes using AI. Right? Now, if you haven't interned in a company in a particular industry, you don't know how they take notes. Right? You don't even know how much importance they give to notes. So how are you going to know that you, if you come up with a solution, is going to be useful, and on top of that, someone will pay for it. It's very hard. So the best is that you observe the market, and then you know from there. Yeah. Since you mentioned that you've made quite a number of prototypes, yeah. at what point during each prototype do you determine when you should stop and move on to like the next stage? Mm. Okay, that's a very, very good question, right? So um, initially, I gave up. Uh, my first project, I stopped working on it when I had a prototype, but I could never get people to click on it, or never get people to come up and test it, right? That usually happens when you actually have a solution which no one is even thinking about, right? And so how you know is that, my based on my experience, the number I set for myself is that if you do not get any insights within one month of development that can take your product from A to B, that's not a jump, right? Then you should just stop doing that. But one month, you can actually get a lot done. Usually, a startup for it to go and reach, like at least raise seed funding or go to the next round, three months is actually more than enough. So if you don't achieve anything in one month, it's time to reconsider and think about like a pivot. Yeah. Other questions? <coughs> yeah. Um, so, think back to my first question, yeah. you mentioned that you can identify problems on, you know, online forums and just see what people are talking about. Again, yeah. that's that's again, you know, just following the hype cycle, right? Yeah. How do you ensure that whatever you know, what whatever you're working on, Correct. remains viable even after the hype cycle sort of dies down? Correct. So, what you want to do is that during the hype cycle, you want to launch your prototype, right? And that's when you get people to click on it. You see, once you start getting people to click on it, then you can do anything with it, right? You can ask them for feedback, or you can see how they are behaving with the prototype, how they're acting. And from there, you get your whatever hype thing you did, and you make it into a product. But if you can never get anyone to click on it, right, your chances of actually creating something good is, is very low, right? So you don't, you don't start with an idea that's going to change the world. You start with a platform where you get a few people and you can change their lives. And then from there you grow, right? Because you cannot think of an idea and be like, boom, this is gonna change the world. It doesn't happen that way, right? You need to constantly change it, constantly validate your assumptions. So you just think about something that can get a certain group of people onto the table. What will excite them to just sit down at the table, right? You bring them in and then you do your test on them, right? Make sense? Yeah.